Welcome to the fourth session at DISC, which will have a strong focus on um, distributed graph algorithms and somewhat the congest model. Um, the first talk will be given by um, Hua Wu um, on a paper that's called Distributed Dense Subgraph Detection in Low Alt Degree Orientation, which is joint work um, with Sinao Su. Hi. Please, Hello. Yes. Yeah. Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, distributed algorithms for dense subgraph detection and low out degree orientation. Uh, as mentioned, this is a joint work with Sinhao Su at Boston College. So let me first define the problem. Um, given the subgraph edge, uh, the density is defined to be the ratio between the number of edges and the number of vertices in that subgraph. Okay, so you can also think of this as uh, proportional to the average degree of that subgraph. And in the densest subgraph problem, uh, the objective is to fight the subgraph with uh, the maximum density D stars. Uh, for example, in this graph below, um, the maximum subgraph is uh, the click of size five on the right hand side. And uh, next, let me uh, also talk uh, mention about the low out degree orientation problem. Uh, in the lowest out degree orientation problem, uh, we want to fight mean to minimize a number z, okay, such that we can orient the edges such that uh, the maximum out degree in the whole graph is at most z, okay. Um, so, um, so this problem is a nice primitive that can be used to um, obtain a pseudo forest decomposition um, or a forest and star forest decomposition in the distributed settings. Uh, why am I talking about two different problems? Um, so it turns out that if you write the linear program for the denser subgraph problem, its dual corresponds to the lowest uh, out degree orientation problem. Now, uh, let me get back to the dense subgraph problem. Um, so it has uh, quite a lot of applications in correlation mining, uh, fraud detection, and community detection in social networks. Uh, you can follow the link there. Um, and the nice thing about this formulation is that even though there are exponentially many subgraphs in a graph, um, there are exact polynomial time algorithms um, based on max flow or linear programming. There are, there are also fast greedy algorithms for this approximation algorithm for this problem. Uh, the problem has also been extensively studied in other settings, uh, streaming dynamic models, MPC model and distributed models. So in this work, we focus on the local model and the congest model. Um, we, the output is that at the end of the algorithm, uh, ideally, each vertex V should output one bit to indicate whether or not it is in the output subgraph. And ideally, for example, uh, we want all the vertices in the densest subgraph to output one and the rest output zero. Okay. And so, it, but the bad news is that uh, any constant approximation would require a uh, diameter wrap. So basically, there's no trivial algorithms for non trivial algorithms for this for the densest subgraph problem. Uh, you can imagine a simple example where you have two clicks of different size that are connected by a path of length diameter. Okay, so this is um, an impossibility result. Okay, so now instead we can consider a parameterized version of this problem that given a global parameter d, we want to output a subgraph uh, with density at least one minus epsilon times d. And if D is smaller or equal than D stars, which is the maximum den subgraph density, then uh, we promise that the output must be non-empty. Okay. Um, so our results in the local model as follow. We give a log n over epsilon route deterministic algorithm for this problem and a one over epsilon route lower bound for any randomized algorithm that succeeds with uh, some high enough constant probability. Okay, and a nice open question is, is the log n factor necessary at all, right? Um, either in the upper bound or the lower bound, we don't know. Okay, so um, 
the key idea is that uh, dense subgraphs are dense and they are well connected and so therefore they have a log n of epsilon diameter approximation right so uh, that's the key lemma so given this lemma uh, there's a very natural problem that each vertex collects its uh, a small neighborhood around itself okay this can be done efficiently in the local model and if b is at most d stars then some vertex must fight a subgraph with high enough density okay uh, there's a caveat is that uh, multiple vertices may uh, that identify a dense subgraphs, and, but then their union may not necessarily be dense. Um, so we want to do some kind of symmetry breaking so that uh, the our final output is a maximal set of disjoint uh, dense subgraphs that the vertex the vertices identify. Okay. Now, if we move to the the congest model, um, the strategy that each vertex collects a small neighborhood is no longer feasible because of the message size restriction. Uh, even if it's a neighborhood, uh, small neighborhood, uh, we could, um, so, but then we still show that for this problem, it is still possible to solve it using randomization and log cube of n over epsilon cube routes, okay? Uh, the corollary is that we can also solve the dense subgraph problem <coughs> um, with a slight, a slight increase in the number of rails and plus diameter term. Okay, this improves upon the previous one half approximation by Death Summer in this uh, 2012. So um, the idea is that uh, we instead looking at the uh, dual linear program for this problem, which is um, the low out degree orientation problem. So in, in this dual linear program for each edge, uh, we have uh, edge is EUV. Uh, we have a constraint that alpha EU plus alpha EV is at least one, which basically means that we have to commit uh, to uh, orient the edge towards U or towards V. We also have another constraint that um, the sum of alpha EU of over all H is E incident to U is at most D. Okay? That means that like, the maximum out degree is at most D. Um, it's a bit intuitive, but it, it turns out that if uh, global parameter D is at most the maximum density, then we can solve this um, dual LP using the multiplicative weights update method. And at some point, we'll have uh, a certificate uh, that says that this dual program is infeasible and that can be routed to fight a dense uh, subgraphs. Uh, but the naive uh, routing would take um, log cube n of epsilon cube plus diameter routes. Okay, So we then use the probabilistic low diameter de de decomposition to get rid of the diameter terms and we just uh, get our final result log cube of n over epsilon cube routes. Okay. So now let's uh, move on to the low out degree orientation problem. So if D is at most is larger than or equal to D star, then uh, using multiplicative weights, we can get a uh, fractional solution for the out degree, low out degree orientation problem. Okay, and the main result is that uh, we can do the routing deterministically in roughly log square of n over epsilon square congest route uh, without increasing the uh, out degree too much. So the main idea is we simply route the solution bits by bit, uh, and we maintain the invariance at alpha EU plus alpha EV is at least one, okay? And the trick is that, uh, the, the tricky thing is that we do not want to increase the fractional uh, out degree by too much at each bit, bit scale and the error accumulate over the bit scales is small enough at the end. Okay, uh, so thanks everyone. Yeah, thank you for the talk. Um, okay, so the next um, talk is on the paper uh, Improved Hardness of Approximation of Diameter in the Congest Model. Um, this is work by um, Hofer Grossmann, Seri Kuri and Amitas and Seri will give the talk. Hello, uh, everyone. So, uh, and uh, welcome to our talk about improved hardness approximation for distributed diameter. This is joint work with Offer Grossman and Amipal. 
Okay, so let me start by explaining what is the diameter of a network. So given a network, the diameter is the maximum distance between any two points in it. For example, in Hungary, where the conference should have taken place, we know that the two points that are farthest apart are Felszoynik and Garbuj. So the distance between these two points is what we call the diameter of the network of roads in Hungary. The diameter is one of the most fundamental graph parameters. It plays a vital role in many theoretical computer science models. And in this work, we're interested in diameter approximation in the distributed set. So let's start. Okay, and let me start by telling you about the distributed model that we work with. And this is the standard contrast model. So in this model, we have a network of n nodes. Each node has an of log n bit identifier. We have synchronized communication rounds. And in each round, each node can send an of log n bit message to each of its neighbors. And we also uh, assume in this model that the nodes are computationally unbounded. And this is because we want to understand the pure challenges of communication. So we assume that any computation at any node can be done for free. And the goal in the contrast model is to compute some function of the network while minimizing the number of communication rounds. So the complexity measure is the number of rounds. Okay, so that's the contrast model. And how fast can we compute the diameter in this model? So we know that a two approximation for the diameter can be done in all of the rounds where D is the diameter of the network. And this is because we can simply compute a BFS from some node U. And the depth of this BFS tree gives a two uh, approximation for the diameter of the network. And our main question in this work is, can we do anything better than that in all of the rounds? So we have a folklore uh, algorithm that gives two approximation. Can we do anything better than that in all of the rounds? And our, our main result is that already finding an approximation better than 11 over 6 requires some polynomial dependency on n, even for constant diameter graphs. So we found a graph in which we can find a two uh, approximation in all of one round, but finding anything better than 11 over 6, which is very close to two, already requires some polynomial dependency on n. And the main technique that we use to prove this result is the well-known technique of reductions from the two-party communication complexity model, and more uh, specifically from the set disjointness problem in the two-party communication complexity model. So uh, unfortunately, I don't have much time to elaborate on this technique in this short talk, but I do spend a few minutes on it in the longer version of this talk, so you are more than welcome to take a look. But let me just give you the key idea of how to uh, apply such reductions. And to illustrate the key uh, idea, I want to give an example for a related problem called the ST diameter. So in this problem, we are given an input graph and two sets of nodes, S and T, and we want to find the maximum distance between some node in S to some node in T. So unlike in the diameter problem in which we care about all pairs of nodes, here we only care about pairs in S times T. And this problem has been considered in the past, and there are known lower bounds for this problem. And these lower bounds are shown via a reduction to the set disjointness problem in the two-party communication complexity model. And the high-level idea of such reductions is usually as follows. There is a fixed graph construction that you can draw it as a sequence of biparted graphs. And there are two strings, x and y. And usually the reduction shows that if you can solve the ST diameter on the graph construction, which depends on x and y, then it implies a solution for set disjointness on x and y. And usually the string x represents a set of shortcut edges in some bipartite the graph, and the string y represents a different set of shortcut edges in a different bipartite the graph in the construction. And the main two key lemmas that are usually proved in such reductions are the following. First, if x and y are disjoint, then for any pair of nodes in S times T, there is a shortcut edge that helps making the distance between them small. And this holds for any pair if x and y are disjoint. Okay, and small in this uh, example means three. And the other key lemma that is usually proved is that if the sets are not disjoint, then there is at least one pair of nodes in S times T for which none of the shortcut edges can help us, and therefore the distance between them must be large. Okay, so there, there is a reduction here from the ST diameter problem to set this jointness. And our main key idea in this work is that if we use bipartite graphs of large GIR instead of just arbitrary bipartite graphs, then we can get a larger gap between the small diameter case to the large diameter case. And specifically, we use constructions that were shown to exist by Benson and Singleton in 64. And these are bipartite graphs with small diameter, large GIR, and a superlinear number of edges. So, uh, Unfortunately, in this short talk, I don't have much time to elaborate on our specific uh, construction, but we do uh, elaborate on it in the longer version of this talk, and you are more than welcome to take a look. 
And if you have any further questions, feel free to ask any of the authors. Let me conclude with some open questions. So first, the natural uh, question is regarding the 11 over 6 approximation. Can we show that we can find it in all of the rounds? In this work, we show that finding anything better than that cannot be done without polynomial dependency on n. The second uh, question is regarding the hardness of radius. So another fundamental graph parameter is the radius of the network. And we are wondering whether we can show the same hardness results for the radius as well. I'm just going to say that we believe that the answer is yes, but we couldn't prove it yet. And the third uh, question is, regard the, is regarding hardness of approximation for the diameter in the sequential setting. So the best conditional lower bound that is known in the sequential setting is for 5 over 3 minus epsilon approximation. In our work, we show improved hardness results for the congestion model. So can we somehow use our large girth ideas in the sequential setting as well? Thank you. Let's thank the speaker. Um, are there questions? Um, please formulate them in the chat, ideally. Um, I have a, a first question to get the discussion started. So you mentioned this Benson-Singleton theorem. Yes. Um, I think it's somewhat interesting that whatever this theorem says, uh, you can basically plug it in, in some sense, as a, as a black box in, in your construction. Um, are you somehow, like, why, why does it stop at 11 over 6? Like, is there any evidence that this cannot be somewhat, um, you know, the sequence can't go on or something like this for this theorem? Like, so that's an excellent question. And the thing is that Benson and Singleton shown uh, that the well-known generalized polygons exist for three, four, and even five and six. But it's not known whether specific generalized polygons, which they have more uh, properties, which we don't need for our uh, purposes, but it's uh, unknown whether generalized polygons exist for any d larger than six. But we do have uh, a conjecture that uh, we are going to add in the in the final version of uh, our work. Uh, so uh, some people in extremal graph combinatorics believe that there should be some graph with slightly different properties. So let's say it's going to have diameter d plus o of 1, and it's going to have gear 2d minus o of 1. And then it's not known whether such dense bipartite graphs exist, but some people in extremal graph theory believe that they do exist. So so uh, given that such subgraphs exist, we can show lower bounds even for two minus epsilon. So uh, we are writing up a conditional lower bound for two minus epsilon, and this lower bound is conditioned on the existence of such subgraphs for larger values of d. So when you say conditional, like conditional in uh, the sequential model or in, in no, the distributed model? No, so it's not conditioned on a hardness of some other problem. It's conditioned on the existence um. of subgraphs that uh, of uh, a bipartite graph that we don't have a proof whether it exists or not. But some people in extremal graph theory uh, told us that they believe it exists, but we don't have any evidence. Yeah, I guess uh, you just mentioned this theorem, and it seems like one of these existential uh, probabilistic method type results. So does that mean that if your results are using this theorem, that your example, you have existence of such a graph, but you don't actually have a way to construct it? Sorry, I didn't understand the question. You mean whether you mean the probabilistic method can show that such graphs well, exist? Or, or I mean, is, is, is this theorem is this theorem constructive? Yes. So, so the theorem by oh. Benson and Singleton it is constructive. It is oh, shown okay. by using the well-known generalized polygons constructions, and uh, I'll be very happy to elaborate on that offline. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Let's uh, thank uh, Seri again. And so we move on uh, to the next paper. Um, again, uh, the speaker won't change. Uh, this is about improved distributed approximation for maximum weight independent set. And the paper is by uh, Kenichi Kawarabayashi, Siri Kuri, Aaron Shield, and uh, Gregory Schwarzman. So please, uh, the voice is okay. yours again. Thank you, uh, Sebastian. So now I want to tell you about a joint work with Kenichi Kawarabayashi, Aaron Shield, and Gregory Schwarzman. And it's about improved distributed approximation for maximum weight independence. Before we start, let me just mention that the preliminary version of this work has appeared as a brief announcement in POTC 2020. Okay, so let's start. So given a graph, an independent set is a subset of the nodes where no two nodes in the subset are adjacent. And given a weighted graph, a maximum weight independent set is an independent set of maximum total weight. So in this example, the value of the maximum weight independent set is 20. 
the maximum weight uh, independence set is one of the most fundamental problems in graph theory. In the sequential setting, it's known to be an NP hard problem. And even having an, uh, an approximation better than delta over log square delta is hard, assuming the unique Gens conjecture, where delta is the maximum degree of a node in the graph. So throughout the talk, I'm gonna denote by delta the maximum degree of a node in the input graph. On the other hand, we know that very simple linear time delta approximation algorithms exist, even for the weighted case. And in this work, our main question is, what is the complexity of finding a delta approximation in the distributed setting? And why specifically we care about delta? Just because it seems to be the natural uh, approximation factor for this problem, at least by looking at the situation in the sequential setting. And our main result is that we can find one plus epsilon delta uh, approximation in poly log log n rounds in the congest model. So recall that uh, in the congest model, we have a network of n nodes. And uh, in each round, each node can send an O of log n bit message to each of its neighbors. Okay, so this is our main result. Let me just give you a quick overview of related work. So there is a folklore ranking uh, algorithm that gives an expected delta plus one approximation in just a single round. And there is a work by Bopana, Halderson, and Davids in which they show a more sophisticated analysis to the same ranking algorithm that gives a slightly better approximation guarantee. And if one, if one is uh, interested in an approximation that is not guaranteed only in expectation, then there is a work by Barry Huda, Sandor Hillel, Gaffar, and Schwarzman, in which they show that a delta approximation can be found in O of MIS log W round, where MIS is the time complexity of finding a maximal independent set, and W is the maximum weight of a node in the graph. Recall that a maximal independent set is not necessarily maximum independent set or a maximum weight independent set. And in this work, we show that by paying one plus epsilon factor in the uh, approximation guarantee, we get an exponential speed up compared to Barry Huda. Okay, but all I'm gonna show you right now is the key idea for how to get O of delta approximation in poly log log n rounds. In order to get the one plus epsilon delta, we need to use more uh, techniques, but unfortunately, we don't have much time in this talk to talk about these techniques. So let me tell you the key idea for the O of delta approximation, and I'm gonna illustrate it for the unweighted case. So the first uh, observation to make in unweighted graphs is that any maximal independent set contains at least n over delta plus one nodes. Okay, so by just finding a maximal uh, independent set, we already can find a delta plus one approximation for maximum independent set in unweighted graphs. And what is the time complexity of finding a maximal uh, independent set? So it takes O of log delta plus poly log log n. Okay, and this is a combination of three works. The first is the recent breakthrough by Rosohan and Gaffari, another work by Gaffari, and another work by Sandor Hillel, Partel, and Schwarzman. Okay, so if delta was small, let's say that delta was O of log n, then we would be done, because this would give an O of delta uh, approximation in poly log log n rounds. But unfortunately, delta can be as large as n. So the main idea is to sparsify the graph and to find a maximal independent set in a sparse subgraph H. And in order for this uh, idea to work, we need this subgraph H to have the following uh, properties. First, the maximum degree in H is small, is O of log n. So finding a maximal uh, independence in H takes only poly, uh, poly log log n rounds. And the second property is that the ratio between the number of nodes in H to the maximum degree in H is at least as in G, or at least not very far from it. So if we can find such a subgraph H, then by just running a maximal independence set uh, algorithm on H, we find an independence set of NH over delta H plus one nodes, which is O of delta approximation to the original input graph G. And it turns out that there is a very simple sampling uh, uh, procedure that we can use. And uh, each node just joins H with probability log N over delta. And let's assume that delta is much larger than log N, otherwise we don't need to specify anything. Okay, and you can use uh, standard uh, Chernoff and union bound uh, arguments to prove that with this sampling, these two properties hold with high probability. And this uh, approach runs into some challenges in the weighted case, and uh, we explain how to overcome these challenges in the longer version of this talk. Let me conclude with a summary and some uh, open questions. So first we find it uh, interesting that the one plus epsilon delta approximation can be found exponentially faster than finding a maximal uh, independent set. And this is because MIS has this lower bound of root of log and over log log n shown by Kuhn, Moshe Broda, and Wattenhofer. 
And next, we want to uh, propose an open question, which is regarding the deterministic complexity of finding an O of delta approximation. And finally, what about approximations that are better than delta? Can we find such an uh, approximation, say, in poly Logan round? That's all. Thank you. Thank you for the talk. So um, I have a, a question um, regarding this classification. Is there any you know any relation to this work on matching sparsifiers that has been there recently like i don't know mis and um, matching that somehow seems somewhat related so i'm wondering whether also this theory of, of of matching sparsifiers would you know somewhat transfer to to your setting it's a good question so the thing is that in the matching uh, problem you want to find usually two uh, approximation so you you want to find a subset of the edges that contains a two uh, approximation for the optimal matching in the uh, original graph. Here, we wanted the sparsification to work so that the maximum degree is small and we still have, and, and uh, we, so the delta H, okay, so we wanted to have a small maximum degree and we still wanted to have the ratio between the maximum degree, uh, sorry, the number of nodes to the maximum degree, at least as in the original graph. So because we looked for specifically delta uh, approximation, this sparsification is very easy. I don't think that if you use the same sparsification, it gives you what you need for matching. I think you need something more sophisticated for, for uh, matching. So what really helped here is that we were looking for delta uh, approximation. So by just picking, you know, each node with the probability log n over delta in expectation, you don't get more than uh, maximum degree O of log n. And this helps us for the uh, sparsification. For the, matching, so for the matching, I think you need ratios, something more sophisticated. This ratio is somehow like very specific to this, this, this problem. So this, um, exactly. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Let's thanks Eri again. And uh, let's move on to the next talk. So uh, the next paper to be presented um, is called Fast Distributed Algorithms for Girth Cycles in Small Subgraphs. Um, this is a paper by Karen sensor hillel Och Fischer, Cyril Gornan, François Legal, Dina Leitersdorf, and Rotem Oschmann. And the talk will be given by Och Fischer. Okay, so thank you. So this is a work about the cycle detection in the limited bandwidth graphs. Uh, so in the subgraph existence problem, we're given some pattern graph H and an input graph G, and our goal is to determine uh, whether and to what extent uh, is H a subgraph of G. And there are three main variants uh, to this problem. A detection in which we need to determine whether H is a subgraph of G. A counting in which we need to count the number of instances of H inside G. And listing in which we need to list uh, all instances of H inside G. Uh, so the main focus of our work is on two problems. Uh, the girth problem in which we need to compute the size of the smallest cycle in the graph. And the 2K cycle freeness problem in which we're given some uh, parameter K which we think of as a constant and we need to determine uh, whether the graph contains a cycle of size exactly 2K. So there are three uh, relevant distributed models to our work. Uh, local congest and congested click. Uh, this, uh, as in previous works, th these are the standard distributed models. And uh, so in congest, the uh, subgraph existence problem tend to be fairly trivial since we can collect our uh, closed neighborhood very efficiently. Uh, so therefore, we focus our attention to the congest and congested click where we need to find uh, more interesting algorithms than the trivial algorithm. Uh, our first result in the congested click is a plus one approximation of the girth, meaning we output either the girth or the girth plus one. And this result is comprised out of uh, two, two components. Uh, the first of which allows us to uh, uh, have each node list uh, all paths it participates in up to some non-constant size. And the second component uh, allows uh, each node, uh, given some uh, radius of the neighborhood that it knows, to double the size of that radius and combining these two results uh, until we reach a cycle. And combining these two results, uh, we get a plus one approximation of the girth in order of one rounds. Our second result in the congested click is a general technique called partition trees, 
uh, which we use to obtain two results. Uh, the first of which is a 2K cycle freeness algorithm in the congested click in order of one rounds. And the second is an algorithm for exact girth, uh, assuming we have some lower bound on the, on the girth, say when the graph is triangle here. Uh, previously, the, there was a, an exact algorithm known but, uh, in the congested click, but it took polynomial time. And we showed that with a plus one approximation, we get it down into order of one. And in cycle freeness, uh, the previous algorithms were also polynomial. And again, we reduced this to order one. Uh, regarding partition trees, so partition trees is a general technique which is related to uh, what is called the sparsity aware algorithms, which are algorithms that get more efficient as the graph becomes sparser. Uh, so this is a sort of a load balancing tool and uh, this tool uh, that we developed in the paper uh, is both uh, more general than previous results and deterministic, which makes it uh, a valuable tool for, uh, for sparsity aware algorithms inside the congested clique. So next we turn our attention to the congest model and there we, we have a new technique we call cycle neighbors, which uh, gives us uh, several results. Uh, so first we get uh, a parameterized algorithm for exact girth, which is sublinear uh, if the girth is uh, not too large. And the second result is uh, an improved algorithm for a small cycle detection and uh, we believe this, uh, this uh, result might be tight, but on the other hand, uh, using the same algorithm, uh, we show a circuit complexity barrier uh, for C6 freeness, which shows that uh, the currently known lower bound of square root of n uh, cannot be improved without uh, incurring major breakthroughs in uh, complexity. Uh, so previously, the, the algorithms in uh, 2K cycle freeness and congest took roughly n to the 1 minus uh, 1 over k squared rounds, and we reduce it to n to the 1 minus 1 over k, which again, we believe is tight for several reasons. Uh, in the barriers, uh, we lift a previous result for a triangle freeness uh, barriers, uh, circuit complexity barriers, and combined with the result we get our uh, barrier for C6. And in the, in the girth problem, so there were several approximation algorithms known, but uh, for exact, only a linear algorithm was known. And we showed that if the girth is not too large, uh, this becomes uh, sublinear. Uh, so uh, thank you. Thank you for your talk. My first question is, um, you are having, like, you showed us uh, many things uh, for the congested clique. I was wondering what if we look at these problems in uh, the broadcast congested clique. So where the message that you send to everyone has to be the same message for an individual node. Is, uh, like, is it known that the problem is your study, um, they are really hard in this broadcast model? Or like, what happens? Can you say roughly something about it? Yes, so that's a great question. So uh, these all uh, strongly assume a unicast uh, congest and in broadcast congest, uh, most of our results uh, are around the cycle freeness and there in cycle freeness, there are very strong lower bounds in the broadcast congest, in broadcast congested click, sorry. Um, sorry, did I understand correctly that for the cycle freeness problem, your techniques also work in the broadcast congested click? No, no, no. So oh, no. in the okay, broadcast sorry. congest, there are strong lower bounds in previous results and uh, we strongly assume that you cast the uh, I see, I see. I see. tools there. I see. Mm -hmm. Thanks, thanks. So the other question I have is more general, like what do you think, maybe personally, what's the main um, problem that's now left open? Like, yes, yeah, so, so that's a great question. So, um, so I think both in the congested click and in the congested are very interesting questions in the suburb freeness and cycle freeness in general. So the first of which is uh, we think that for small cycles, what we got is uh, is optimal for several reasons, but for larger cycles, we get this result for uh, up to uh, C10 or C12. And for larger cycles, it's still in the roughly uh, 1 minus 1 over k squared. And we think this should also be uh, 1 over k. So, so that's, in the, that's at least one major problem in the congest. And in the congested click, I think that exact girth or in general, uh, cycle freeness, uh, uh, no, not a even cycle freeness, sorry, but uh, 
general cycle freeness or exact growth is, is, is a very interesting problem. Uh, they're heavily related to matrix multiplication. Yuka has a question. Um, could you please unmute yourself and just ask yourself, please? Yeah, I can unmute myself. I was mainly wondering, looking at your uh, constant time algorithms for the congested click, uh, how much extra bandwidth there is available? I mean, can you solve many independent instances also in course of time? Can you solve log n or root n or linear number of independent instances also in course of time using your algorithms or some modifications of this? Yes, so that is a great question. So we looked at it a bit. So for exact growth, I think we we were fairly close to, to obtaining such a result, but uh, I'm not, so there are several uh, steps in this algorithm, some of which are uh, very efficient, some of which are less efficient. So I'm not entirely sure, but we can take this uh, offline. Uh, I think in the partition trees technique, that, that, that's also a, a good question. Uh, I think, yeah, since it's uh, sparsity aware, if the graph becomes much sparser, then you can do a lot more. I, I'm not entirely sure uh, online. Okay, great. Then uh, let's thank uh, the speaker again. Um, let's go to the next talk, uh, the next presentation. So the next uh, paper to be presented is called uh, Distributed Maximum Matching Verification in Congest. Um, this is a paper by Mohammad Adag Amadi, sorry, um, and by Fabian Kuhn. And um, Mohammed will give the talk. Hello, everyone. My name is Mohammed Ahmadi, and I would like to talk about distributed maximum matching in the congest model. This is a joint work with my advisor, Fabian Kuhn. Maximum matching problem, uh, given an arbitrary graph G, the problem asks for an independent set of edges in G with maximum cardinality, like the set of red edges in this simple graph that do not share any endpoints and have maximum size. We studied a problem in the congest model. There's a computer network abstracted as a, a graph where the nodes represent the computers and the edges represent the possibility of communication between two computers in the network. Communication is synchronous. That is time is synchronously seen by all the nodes uh, as a sequence of rounds such that every round R starts at time R minus one and ends at time R. In each such round, every node first performs an arbitrary local computation, and then it exchanges a log of n bit message with each of its neighbors. To compute the exact solution for the maximum matching problem, we know that we can solve the problem uh, for buffetized graphs in time almost linear in the size of the maximum matching, but quadratic for general graphs. And the challenging question here is that whether we can do better for general graphs. However, the contribution of our work is not to actually compute uh, the maximum matching, rather to verify it. To be more precise, uh, given an undirected graph G and an unweighted matching M, we provide a randomized algorithm that verifies that M is maximum in O of M rounds or disprove it to be maximum in O of D plus L rounds, where D is the diameter of the network and L is the length of the shortest augmenting path in the network with respect to the given matching. An augmenting path is an alternating path between two unmatched nodes, also known as free nodes, such that the edges along the path alternate between the edges inside and outside the matching. The general outline of our algorithm is quite simple. For an exponentially increasing parameter r, the algorithm looks for an augmenting path of length at most r. To have a termination condition for this loop, the algorithm first computes the size of the given matching, and it stops as soon as it finds an augmenting path or the value of parameter r becomes larger than four times the size of the given matching. So the conclusion of the algorithm is based on a well-known fact that a matching is maximum if and only if there's no augmenting path in the network with respect to that matching. So if the algorithm finds an augmenting path, it concludes that the, uh, the given matching is not maximum, and otherwise it concludes that the, maximum, uh, that the matching is an optimal solution. The total time complexity of this algorithm actually depends on how fast the algorithm can detect 
whether there exists an augmenting path of length at most r or not. To that end, we provide a randomized protocol to detect whether there exists an augmenting path of length at most r in the graph in all of r rounds with high probability. Having such a tool at hand, the algorithm that I just described have a total time complexity of O of D plus L rounds. O of D rounds for the first step, we compute the size of the given matching, and O of L rounds for the all repetitions of the for loop, where L is the last value of parameter R, which is actually the maximum length of an augmenting path that the algorithm looks for. So this was the general outline of the algorithm, but I would, I would like to talk about uh, the randomized uh, augmenting path detection protocol, which is the central challenge of our work. This augmenting path detection protocol is based on a clustering that we define and call the free node clustering. All clusters are centered at unmatched nodes, F1 to F4 in this figure. And these clusters are formed and constructed by a quite involved implementation of a parallel BFS starting from all unmatched nodes along all alternating paths. Having such a clustering, every node has two properties. For every node V, the node only join at most one cluster. And it also knows two things, the length of its shortest alternating path that reaches V over its matched edge as well as the length of its shortest alternating path that reaches V over its, one of its unmatched edges. So if we have such a clustering, then we can show that there exists at least one shortest augmenting path that is exactly partitioned in two pieces into two neighboring clusters. Therefore, the two nodes U and W at the border, because they know the length of their shortest alternating path through their matched edge, in this figure, and if the edge between U and W were a matched edge, then they would know uh, the length of their alternating path through their um, unmatched edges, then they can calculate actually the length of the augmenting path that they reside on. So they can detect the augmenting path. So I would like to invite you for a more in-depth discussion of the clustering, how to construct it, and how to use it to um, detect an augmenting path. But I want to mention here that uh, although we detect uh, the existence of an augmenting path of some length, we cannot actually construct it. And that's the obstacle that we have to actually compute a maximum matching. And we are only uh, able of um, evaluating the quality. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for this talk. Um, I have a question. Maybe it's a, a dumb question. Um, I was wondering, like, why is time proportional to um, the size of the matching? Why is this somewhat the goal, like the holy grail in some sense? Like, are, are there any lower bounds that I'm missing? Uh, I didn't understand your question. So the, the question is like, um, is there, for example, a, a linear lower bound for this problem so that um, this the non the non lower bound um, is d plus root n, as far as I know, so uh, diameter d plus root n. So li having linear algorithm, and we have linear algorithm for bucket of graphs, almost linear of course, and n log of n, or k log of k if k is the size of the maximum matching, but quadratic for general graphs. Mm -hmm. I see. So the first goal is somehow to match the bipartite um, one, but to the best of our knowledge right now, it's not ruled out that maybe even something sublinear might at some point be possible. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have one question. Please. Yes. So uh, it, uh, is the reason why you can construct the augmenting path is because the, it's not bipartite? or this is caused by the graph is uh, general, uh, can be general graph. Uh, what I'm saying is that uh, is the bottleneck that the graph is a general graph to prevent you to construct the augmenting path. Yes, actually that's true. And the, the main difference between bipartite graph and general graphs and in this way of 
uh, looking for an augmenting path, why I cannot, why we cannot with this algorithm actually construct a path is the existence of odd cycles and some property which is called BFS honesty property, which is valid in bipartite graph, but not in general graphs. So mm -hmm. the, the point is that um, when we have this, um, this path that is detected, the only thing that we can learn is these two nodes, U and W, and the two endpoints of the augmenting path and the length of the augmenting path. But we cannot trace back because um, some of these nodes cannot know which node is the, so to say, parent. Um, unfortunately, I cannot go to more details because it depends on, on the, um, uh, the protocol, the details, which is based on the flow circulation. And receiving the proper fraction of a flow for the first time over some edge from some neighbor does not conclude for the node that this node is actually the correct neighbor to trace back to. I see. So that's why we cannot, uh, in general graphs, um, mm -hmm. construct the path. If we could construct a path, then uh, we could actually have a almost linear time algorithm for general graphs. And what I want to also mention here is that um, a, a good direction to look at could be that um, whether we can do this clustering in a way that there exists an augmenting path that is partitioned into two pieces in a more balanced way. So right now there's no guarantee that when we partition an augmenting path into two neighboring clusters, this path is partitioned in a balanced way. If we have such a guarantee, then by repeating the clustering within each cluster, we can actually construct the path, the complete path, after logarithmic um, repetition of this clustering process. I see. That's very but, interesting. But maybe one can more elegantly use randomness in this clustering so that we can guarantee uh, that we have a balanced partitioning. Because after you do the clustering right away, you can check whether this partitioning is balanced or not, because U and W know their corresponding length to the cluster center. Okay, thank you for the discussion. There are two um, brief announcements uh, left to be presented in this session. Um, the first one is called um, uh, Phase Transitions of the K-Majority Dynamics in a Biased Communication Model. It's a paper by Emilio, Crush Emilio Crushani, uh, Alpi Mimun, Matteo Petropani, and Sara Rizzo. Um, Sarah will give uh, the talk. Please go ahead. Hi, hi everyone. Uh, thank you, Sebastian, for the introduction. So uh, our work uh, um, is based on uh, an analysis of the. Oh, sorry. Okay, an analysis of the K majority that is uh, one of the simple stochastic processes on graphs called uh, dynamics in which every node has a state that can be red or blue, for example, in the case of a binary state. And uh, uh, these processes can be seen also as a, a distributed algorithm for consensus, looking at their convergence configuration and uh, their convergence time. Some examples of dynamics are the voter model, the tree majority, and the K majority dynamics. In our work, we analyze the K-majority dynamics in a bias communication model that we are going to, to describe. Supposed to have a graph in which every node has a binary state, red or blue. We consider a bias communication model which is biased toward the state blue. We define what we call the KP blue majority dynamics as follow. Um, in, the, in this dynamics, every node selects, uh, as in the standard uh, K-majority, K-random neighbor uh, uniformly at random. But here, whenever nodes uh, sample a neighbor, they see the state blue regardless the, the actual state of the sample node with uh, some probability P. They see instead uh, the true state with probability 1 minus P. Then uh, the node update its state to the majority color. This bias communication model was introduced by Krushani and other authors, um, and they use it, uh, use it as a tool for the analysis of the two choices dynamics. We analyze the biased uh, K majority on undirected graphs uh, sufficiently dense, 
and with an initial configuration in which uh, uh, every node is in state red. We prove that uh, there exists a constant p star k uh, between 1 over 9 and 1 half, such that if p is less than p star k, the process needs a super polynomial number of rounds to reach a blue almost consensus. On the other hand, if p is greater than p star k, the blue almost consensus is reached in a constant number of rounds. This results also um, asymptotically almost surely. We prove also that uh, when p is less than p star k, the system remains in a metal stable phase in which the volume of uh, red node is a constant fraction of the total volume of the graph. And uh, uh, this particular phase lasts uh, for um, any polynomial number of rounds. We further show the presence of another phase transition on the initial configuration when p is uh, uh, greater than p star k uh, it does in, the, in the, the slow convergence regime. In conclusion, uh, with this work, we give a kind of measure of the initial consensus robustness and the presence of uh, a metastable phase uh, of this process makes the K majority a suitable tool to recover printer partition in network, as done by Krushani and uh, Isco Eutor uh, for the two choices dynamics. This uh, concludes my talk. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much. We have time for a quick question. Yeah, uh, how does the constant CP in the metastable phase depend on P? And what would the constant be approximately as P hits the uh, P, P star? So the, the constant CP of the metastable, metastable phase, yes, depends on P. And uh, uh, what is the second question? I didn't understand. How, how does it depend on P? Like, Sorry? How does CP depend on P? Uh, actually, it's not uh, uh, really explicitly. Uh, I, I can give you the details of line uh, because here I don't remember okay. exactly the, the, the role of P. Okay. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Okay, now um, we come to the last pick in the session. Um, it's called uh, Distributed Quantum Proofs for Replicated Data. Uh, it's a paper by Pierre Frenot, Francois Lugal, Harumichi Nishimura, and uh, Ami Pass. Um, Ami will give the talk. So, uh, following Maurice's uh, question and answers uh, session before, we indeed work on uh, quantum, uh, using quantum computation in distributed setting. And specifically in this work for distributed proofs of a problem called replicated data. So in the replicated data problem, we have a network where some of the nodes are terminals that have a big amount of data in them that should be the same in all of them, all of these servers or terminals. And others just are just realized that help them and don't have uh, the full data in advance. So on the left, we see a graph where all the copies of the data are the same, which is okay. And on the right, not all the copies are the same, which is of course not okay. And we want to uh, distinguish the two cases. So this kind of questions was asked a lot in distributed computing under names like proof leveling schemes, locally checkable proofs, interactive proofs, or distributed mainly ample games. And in this work, we define a mechanism called quantum proofs or distributed quantum mainly ample proofs. Now in all these mechanisms, there is a no all entity called Merlin or something else that gives certificates to the units and to the nodes of the graph, to the units in the network. And then they exchange messages in order to verify that the state of the system is okay. In our case, that all the copies of the data are the same. And the main, the first result we show is just uh, presenting this mechanism of distributed quantum L and R2 proofs. The main result is a uh, distributed quantum L and R2 protocol for this replicated data problem that depends logarithmically on n. Here n, as in communication complexity, is the size of the data replicated. And the dependence on uh, n is only logarithmic, both for the certificate size and the message size. And finally, we show that if you don't use quantum uh, states, 
but you could still still use randomization. For example, you need linear size uh, certificates or messages. You cannot have the log n log n setting as we have. A very rough idea of what we do is the following: for a piece of data or string x, we define a quantum fingerprint. Uh, so in communication complexity, you'd like to take X and hash it, this will not work uh, straightforward. But using quantum fingerprints, what you do is take many hash functions and the hashes of your input X using these functions, and then have a sum or a product state of all of them together. This is this fingerprint. And now the certificates of all the nodes, the certificates given to all the nodes by Merlin, will be, will be these quantum fingerprints. And the verification phase, every two neighbors will check they have the same fingerprint as a certificate. And if you also have a data, data, let's say your Alice A on the left and you have this data X, then you will uh, apply the algorithm to get the fingerprint of X and make sure this is equivalent, equal to the certificate you got. So this is the main procedure. And very simplified, of course. And to conclude, we showed this indeed using quantum uh, states give exponential advantage in distributed certification as well. This was known in some settings, but not in the setting of distributed certification. And the main open problems are have uh, quantum verification algorithms for all other Boolean predicates on labeled graphs. Say you want to prove that your network is triangle free or it, it has some non trivial symmetry on it. And another question is how to prove lower bounds when your certificates are quantum. We showed a lower bound for the non-quantum case and an upper bound for the quantum case. How do you prove a lower bound for the quantum case? This is not clear. And uh, I'll stop here, thank you very much. Thank you very much for the talk. So uh, I have a question. Uh, thank you, Ami, for the great talk. And uh, so uh, in the standard contrast model, for example, we know that verification can be harder than uh, uh, construction, right? Because there are uh, examples by the, the Sarma paper. Uh, do we know such a theorem for quantum uh, verification? Is there any example for which constructing a, a solution in quantum congest is easier than verifying it in quantum congest? That, that, that's a good question. I should say, well, first of all, that I don't know the answer. Uh, but I don't think it is known also. And our model is not exactly uh, quantum congest. It's more like quantum proof leveling schemes or distributed quantum mailing auto, if you want to be exact. Uh, so it's not exactly quantum congest, anyhow. And maybe just a comment, the construction versus uh, verification, it's not clear that the verification that you think of is I have a structure and I have to uh, verify it and not like proof leveling schemes, which are more similar to NP. If you want to think in, as construction versus verification as P versus NP, then maybe you can, sh should think of congest versus proof leveling schemes. But that's a more general note about this talk and quantum computing specifically. Okay, thank you. So in the interest of not uh, going too much over time, let's stop here. I would like to thank all the speakers of this session again. Let's uh, give them a clap.